All right, good morning. Turn first to Romans chapter 14. Romans 14, and then turn over to, and we'll be there first, and then Ephesians 4. Romans 14, 19, Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. Matthew 5, 9 reads, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Turn over to Romans 14, 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for which make for peace, and the things by which one may edify another. Romans or Ephesians four. Ephesians four, the first three verses. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering and bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And all God's people said. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And our study, so far we have Get this thing to go. We have looked at two of five points of what does it mean to be a peacemaker. The first two that we saw were because you have peace with God, then uh, because of your faith alone and Christ alone, you have the free gift of eternal life, uh, that you now have that peace with God, but also you need to share that reality with the message of life. The second thing we looked at was having the peace of God. And the peace of God is one of those doctrines uh, that is challenging for believers. It is mainly uh, a real hallmark of a maturing believer that whenever the situations in life get challenging, you can be stable rather than emotionally driven and tossed here and there and up and down and around and upside and downside and around side uh, that uh, that people get. We talked about the soul fortress uh, that comes uh, from uh, Philippians 4, 5 through 7. They said, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Now, most of the time, of course, whenever we're under a lot of pressure, a gentle spirit is not typically what we practice. <laughs> a humble spirit, a gentle spirit. It says the Lord is near. Uh, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the, what does it say? And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's the soul fortress. Um, so the next thing that we want to look at is to be a peace preserver. A peace preserver. Uh, we saw in Romans, well, in Romans 14, 19. Why don't you go ahead and turn there? Romans 14, 19. Romans 14, 19. Romans 14, 19 is a short verse, but yet powerful challenging and it says so then we pursue we chase after we go after pursue the things which make for peace he's talking about in the church but also marriage and family because you're all brothers and sisters in christ your wife is part of the church your husband is part of the church and your children so we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another, not tearing one another down. It, it's, its primary discussion is within the body of Christ. 
within the local church to always do that which makes peace with other people and to build them up spiritually rather than to tear them down. Backbiting, gossip, and slander is not building someone up. <laughs> and also then turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. We have to ask ourselves, am I a peace preserver or a troublemaker? <laughs> a lot of people are troublemakers. And they can be troublemakers in their home, as well as within the church. But 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stop there for a second. When Paul says, I exhort you, he is like coming alongside and saying, this is something that you need to absolutely pay attention to. And then he adds, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to emphasize the critical importance um, of what he is about to say. That you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, we could spend all day just talking about that verse, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory. You'd be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment, the same mind to think the same level of things as far as doctrine is concerned, the same evaluations, realizing that we are to live in peace with one another, to agree with one another, to support one another. That's the challenge. And of course, uh, it, it also in uh, Hebrews 10 says that we are to build one another up uh, to exhort one another daily while it is still today in Hebrews 3. Uh, and you can't do that. That's why it says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. You cannot build up someone else and encourage them spiritually if you are not present. Now, there's always, you know, the the potential that there's sickness or there's other things that happen that keep a person from being able to attend Bible class. But when we have a choice, and choice a lot of times too goes along with the, the jobs that we choose. We've talked about that. Um, but we cannot be uh, the proper builder uppers, <laughs> if that's a word, of other believers if we're not present. So always seek on how to build one another up. Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 3. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Now I want you to think about this, not only within the church and your brothers and sisters, but in your home, your spouse. Yeah. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Remember, you can't read scripture off my face, so I... Encourage you, open your Bibles. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Remember, the Spirit of God has promised only to use the Word of God to help get the doctrine into your soul. I'm here to help explain it and to expound on it, but it's the Word itself is the power of God. Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, to walk, that is to live your life in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. What is the calling? The calling is into the royal family of God and to be an inheritor in the coming kingdom. That's your calling. Walk worthy of that. Remember, you are a child of the king. You're royalty. Walk in the light of that. Don't act like just an everyday, uh, you know, unbeliever walking around. Uh, you are in a much different situation. Therefore, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You notice it doesn't say make the unity of the spirit. Preserve the unity of the spirit. The reason it says that is because as believers, we all 
have the same spirit indwelling us. That makes us unified in the body of Christ. It's our job to preserve that unity so that then it becomes a matter of peace. We can live in a peaceful way, building one another up, encouraging one another, uh, which is part of our primary duty to the Lord. Philippians chapter two, one to four. Philippians chapter two, one to four. Philippians two, one to four says, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any encouragement, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Holy Spirit, if any affection and compassion, in other words, if there's this the slightest little hint of all of this, and there is because we're one in Christ, then he says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. In other words, this is who you are. Now, therefore, act this way. Uh, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. What's the one purpose? To maintain unity. To be together, to be one. The reason he's saying this is because uh, in the church at Philippi, there was a problem. And I'll read that verse to you in a second uh, in verses uh, uh, two and three of chapter four. But let's go on. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, note this very carefully, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Take the back seat. <laughs> Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, you want to talk about a command that is contrary to the normal operations of the old sin nature? That's it, isn't it? To think of someone else more highly than yourself. The psychological systems of the world today, which take the scripture and turn it on its head, say, it's all about you. You have to affirm yourself. That's right. Look out for number one, all these other things. But is the opposite from Scripture. So then he says in Philippians chapter 4, 2 and 3, turn over there. Now, how would you love to have your name known 2,000 years later? Wouldn't that be great? Well... Maybe not. Because there's a couple of women in the church that were having a fight with each other. The old preacher uh, wasn't very good at pronouncing names and he looked at that and he came across this and he said, I urge you odious. <laughs> and I urge soon touchy to live in harmony. How many believers... They stink with their attitudes and they're touchy about everything. Don't you say that about me. <laughs> he says, I urge Yodia and I urge Synthaki to live in harmony in the Lord. <laughs> Indeed, true companion. He's talking. Uh, who's he's right near Timothy. I I, also, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Help these women. Help them do what? Live in harmony with one another. Live in harmony with one another. You know, they, they uh, many preachers have said and and. So I, I'll probably step on a few toes, but many preachers have said, and it's long experience, that so often the turmoil in the church comes from three sources. The number one source is the women who want to fight with each other. 
If you don't believe that, ask them to serve the church in the same kitchen together. One of the things that happened to Westside not long after I got here, remember this, Marsha? We were having a Easter breakfast, I believe it was, wasn't it? And oh my goodness, it was it was like rockets flying off, sparks flying every which direction. We had visitors here, and I was absolutely shocked at everything that was being said and done. Matter of fact, the former pastor, Brother Scott, uh, was still here, and he came running up those steps because I was up here, and he said, you better get downstairs and solve this problem. So I solved the problem. Our women don't cook in our kitchen anymore, and they haven't for well over 20 years except a little bit of serving or whatever, but as far as sitting in there, we don't even have a stove to cook on anymore. We don't. What can I say? The second source is their deacons of trouble. The third source is the musicians and the singers. Yeah. One of the uh, one of the tough things with all of that is that just people are people, and that's why we have to work at these things. Let's go on. Philippians four eight. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise. Dwell on these things. Set your mind on those things in reference to the other people. Husbands and wives that do that find themselves getting along pretty good. Your wife or your husband is not you. Your wife or your husband is not perfect. And trying to make them perfect is going to create conflict. Don't try and make them do the things like you do or the way you do, or the way you think, except, except in learning the word of God together. First Peter 3, turn to First Peter 3, 8 through 12. First Peter 3, 8 through 12. First Peter 3, 8 through 12 says, are you there? How many of you not there? Oh, me. All right, First Peter. It, to make it easy, it comes right in front of Second Peter. So there you go. Find Revelation, make a left turn. There you are. First Peter three eight through twelve. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but instead giving a blessing. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. What is he talking about to inherit a blessing? What do you think he's hinting at? Inheriting the kingdom. The reward that's going to come for being a peacemaker. Exactly what the Lord said himself. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the sons of God. We'll talk about that. So this it goes on to say, For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. What is the evil? It is the opposite of what he said. This person, the evil one, is not harmonious, not sympathetic, not brotherly, not kind-hearted, not humble in spirit, and they are returning evil for evil and insult for insult, and they're not giving anybody a blessing except to, like they used to say down south, they're going to bless them out. And bless them out wasn't God bless you. It may have used God's name, but not wrong, not rightly. So notice that Paul over and over again is speaking boldly to the believers in the local churches. He uses the terms implore, exhort, urge. 
he repeatedly pointed to people or appointed people to the necessity of loving behavior toward one another in the life of Christ. Many believers are passive, afraid to offend, look the other way, approach, will never result in one being a peacemaker. A peacemaker has to be courageous in Christ to lovingly but directly speak the word where needed. Calling for peace within the church is a divine mandate that we cannot ignore. And one thing I love about Westside, for a long, long time, we've had tremendous peace. You know that? Yeah. Peace with each other. It's a reflection of your maturing in Christ. And that's a wonderful thing. Now, I don't know about husbands and wives. You know, that's like I've said before, sometimes husbands and wives come walking in and they were stepping all the way here in the car. And as soon as they walk in the door, they try to act all spiritual. All right, let's go on. You got to be a peace giver. A peace giver is sharing by attitudes and actions, even toward unbelievers. Romans 12, 14 to 21. Romans 12, 14 to 21. You see, beloved, we have to be a peacemaker, not a peace taker or a peace faker. <laughs> a peacemaker, not a peace taker, and not a peace faker. When I, what's a peace faker? Instead of living harmonious with somebody, you don't necessarily say anything out loud, but in your mind, the things you're thinking about them probably will be called murder if you carried it out. <laughs> Remember, what you think matters. That's why Paul says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Romans 12, 14 to 21. Let's just see how opposite this is to the norm of our society and the sin nature. Bless those who persecute you. You know, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about Christians who were being persecuted by unbelievers. And that's the thrust here. And it said that they accepted the confiscation of their material goods with joy. In other words, because they were believers, they had these unbelievers who were actually coming in and cleaning out their house and persecuting them, throwing them in jail and all kinds of other things, and they were rejoicing. How can you do that? You can do that only because you know it's for the sake of Christ. It's for his glory. And ultimately, what happens is that you get the reward, not so much here, but there. They may even take your life here. We better remember these things with what is perhaps coming very quickly here to the United States. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's a problem for a lot of people because if you're having struggles and somebody else, uh, their struggles are resolved. Let's just say that you are having a real financial issue and somebody in the church gets a nice financial gift or something happens to where, you know, things are good for them. Jealousy tends to rear its head. Covetousness tends to rear its head. And that's why it's saying, rejoice with those who rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice with them that that has been solved. And don't think that somehow or another that because yours hasn't been that then, you know, you, you should have a right to some of their money or whatever. Right. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Stop. There's a lot of churches that are filled with the doctors and the lawyers and the highfalutins and the people on the high end of life. And they got money in the bank and they can build these fancy cathedrals and churches and all kinds of things. But it's like happened here many years ago when the pastor of another church. When we were had a had an active ministry dealing with people, drug addicts and so forth. Um, 
he came in the back door of this church and asked me what we were doing because he'd heard about it. And he said, how do you do things like that? He said the people, you know, basically, he didn't say quite these words, but basically the people in his church wouldn't put up with it. They were too good to be with those who were the lowly. Well, you know what I love about Westside? We're a bunch of lowly. Amen. We're a bunch of lowly. Let's go on. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, not just believers, but also unbelievers. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Underline that. As far as it depends on you. You cannot solve somebody else's issues, but you can solve your own on how you respond to the issue. A lot of times those things may happen at work where people say things or do things and you know you you really would prefer just to i don't know make maybe they could swallow a firecracker and blow up or something <laughs> but yet as far as it depends on you be at peace with all men never take your own revenge beloved but leave room for the wrath of god for it is written vengeance is mine i will repay says the lord but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. That's, that's not saying, therefore, I'm going to give this to you, and God's just going to bring the fire down from heaven on top of him. The idea of the burning coals is like an incense to God. Quite opposite of what people think. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. Who are the outsiders? Unbelievers. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the knowledge of God, the word of God applied to daily life. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Always be ready to give an answer is part of what we have in our apologetics course. Always be ready. Look for ways and open doors to share the message of life so that you can be a peace giver. <laughs> share what you have received. It goes on to say, let your speech always be with Grace, not with grit, but with grace, as though seasoned with salt. Don't say, ha, salty speech. I get to cuss them out. No. You season it with salt, which means your language back to them is positive and flavorful. So that you will know how you should respond to each person. Be a peacemaker, not a peace taker, or a peace faker. The last one as we close out this section, the point five of being a peacemaker is a peace prayer. Now, it's the same word as prayer, but prayer, the person who prays. Psalm 122, six through nine says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and sisters, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, I will seek your good. Psalm 122, 6 through 9. Pray for Israel. Amen. There's um, five points. Let me give them to you real quick. You, they're on the on the board. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. First and foremost is to pray that Jewish people come to faith in Yeshua for eternal life. He is the Prince of Peace. Pray for Jewish people to come to faith in Yeshua. Secondly, pray for the peace of Jerusalem is praying for peace in the nation so the message of life can be shared. Peace in the nation so the message of life can be shared. There are many born-again 
people there, Jewish people there, who are sharing the truth of the message of life. Three, pray God's hand will hold back the surge and hate against the Jewish people. Amen. Do you know this last October 7th? We're going to have something more to say about this later. But by the way, if you're not registered to vote, get out and register and vote. It is, we, this is our last ditch effort for our country. Evil is abounding. We'll talk more about this later. But talk about, on October 7th, had the one year anniversary of what happened in Israel, the slaughter. And Kamala Harris came out on that day and said, I will always support the Palestinian people. Don't believe for a second that she and the Democrats in this country are not extremely anti-Semitic because they are. Yep. They're anti-Israel. And it needs to be known. And believers who know our God and know what the Abrahamic covenant says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. If you want this nation to be cursed, just let them get the office. We've been going down this road for a while, but this is as tragic as tragic can be. And there's many other reasons too. I, I see these hair signs. I want to walk up and knock on the door and say, why do you believe in the murder of babies? Why do you believe in the destruction of the First Amendment and the Second Amendment? Why do you believe in the destruction of family? Why do you believe in the destruction of the nation of Israel? Two-state solution? You know, if they get a quote-unquote two-state solution, the one portion of Israel would only be 10 miles wide. That's that's five miles less than here to Greenville. How, can, how could you defend that? You can. It's only for the destruction. The land is not anyone else's but Israel's. And by the way, there's no such thing as Palestinians. Never has been. The people who lived in that land were under the Ottoman Empire. And when the nations were divided out uh, after World War I and World War II, then uh, the people that were living there fell into the nation of Israel. Uh, but let's go on. D, pray the hearts of those who engage in anti-Semitic online in schools and colleges and in protests against Israel will have their hearts and minds changed. Unbelievably that our colleges are fielding thousands of people calling for the destruction of Israel. From the river to the sea means the destruction of Israel and the killing of every Jew that lives there. Mm. Finally, pray for the peace of Jerusalem by praying for the return of the Prince of Peace, Amen. Yeshua himself. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, that's exactly right. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this very special time around your word. Thank you for these blessed people here and online and those who will be watching. May the truth seep deep into our souls. And Father, may we be as believers willing to take action for this, this line of defense for our country, Father, uh, in praying and in action. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. All right, we got about 15 minutes, so.